The invitation is on actually six, six, nine. Six, six, nine. <laughs> Get it straight, Justin. This <laughs> morning, the title of my lesson is Two Masters, uh, from the context of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. Uh, it was Jesus who taught his disciples the concept I want to study this morning when he said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And in this context, he gave the example of something he could be talking about with the example of wealth, saying, you cannot serve God in mammon, uh, meaning riches or wealth, meaning two different masters. Uh, so we, we learn in several spots in Scripture that Jesus calls people of the world to make him the only master of their life. Uh, he is the only master of, of, of our lives as a member of the Godhead and as the Son of God. Uh, he can't be second, is, is his command. Serve Christ above everything else and, uh, and put him first above all others in priority. Matthew 16, verse 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Right, insert there, I am, I will be your master, and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, truly, a master can be defined as one who has the rule over you, one who is a lord or in charge of somebody, calling the shots, giving instructions, commanding orders. Uh, we call him the Lord, Jesus Christ. Right? That means he's the master over our lives. He's supposed to be. That's what he's asking us to do. Uh, and he, he tells us how to live. Uh, the, these guiding principles in Scripture. We submit to His will, not ours. There are some things that we would like to do differently, probably, if it, was, if it was our life that we were trying to live, but we're giving up our will to do His. And all else falls second uh, to the one who is ruler over the spiritual kingdom or a part of. And Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God, the kingdom which I am head over, He said, and God's righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew six thirty three. Uh, he scolded some in Luke chapter uh, six and verse forty six. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Uh, so we learn here that calling him your Lord should imply that you do the things he is saying for you to do. Uh, so obedience, submission. And then as, as this uh, concept is stated in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6 for us today, even though it's written in the Old Testament, we know this Old Testament applies to following Jesus today. Uh, it says, trust in the Lord. Well, Jesus is the Lord. With all your heart. Everything Jesus commands, everything written in the New Covenant, trust it with all your heart. It's been given by Jesus and the apostles and the Holy Spirit. And lean not on your own understanding. Follow what it says. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He's your master. He shall direct your path. Okay, so Jesus is in charge over the decisions and the manner of life we're going to live. If he's our master, we're going to be changed in serving him uh, if we so choose to designate him as the master of our life. But what we're studying today is when the master, Jesus Christ, said, okay, if I am to be your master, then you must understand this basic principle and this basic truth. You can have no other master. Yes, in fact, it is impossible. I and mean, if you really break this down, which we're going to do here, uh, it's really impossible to serve two masters biblically at the same time. And that's what Jesus is getting at. By definition here, a master is the individual or the, the thing that you put first over everything else. And by definition, only one can be the master over you. Because if, if you had one master in charge of you over here, and I like these two pictures of, of pretend you have two different men who are your masters, uh, and you're, you're living in the first century and you're a slave or whatever it is. So if, if you have one master in charge of you over here asking you to do one thing, 
And you have another master in charge of you over here exact, uh, ask, asking you the exact opposite thing. Then whichever master you choose to obey, Romans chapter 6 says, you are that one servant to whom you obey. You got to pick, don't you? The one who you obey over the other one, that's your true master. Obedience yields and, and defines who your master is. So you can claim you have one master, but you obey someone else or something different. So let's use this as an illustration. If two individuals, two different individuals were designated as your boss at work, and that happens sometimes, by the way. Uh, sometimes there will be the main boss, or there will be the boss and his wife, or there will be the main boss and a supervisor, and both of them are essentially over you in rank and in power. And you're supposed to listen to both. So you've got two masters. And, and let's say that both of them in positions over you both told you to do something, but they conflicted with each other. Contrary things. I remember that would happen once in a while when I used to work at the, the sod farm when I was younger. Because at that time, there was a portion of when I worked there that there really were four co-owners in the same family at the same time. Uh, they had split the ownership of the farm four ways. So for a time, we had to try to deal with having four bosses uh, claiming equal rank to the other. But if you're trying to serve two or more masters at the same time, let's contemplate what happens when the masters oppose each other. Because that's what happened a couple times at the sod farm. Uh, if two masters give conflicting commands, well, then here's what happens. You will say, well, you know, master number one told me to do this. But master number two told me exactly the opposite. If you then say, well, boss number two is actually the one I care most about pleasing, and I'll take the heat from boss number one later, uh, and instead you go ahead and heed the boss, the boss two, then do you realize you just made one, your true master, the, the true boss, over the other? You, you honor that individual more than the other. And when you picked which one you choose to listen to. And again, that was my mindset back when I worked on the sod farm. Of the four bosses in charge over me, if they all conflicted, I knew which one I was going to listen to over the other three. Because I'd get in more trouble from him than the other three. And so you see, there can only be one true master that you pick over everything else and everybody else. Because you can only listen to one at a time when they conflict, not two. So you must choose. So do you see what Jesus was then saying here? Inherently, a slave can only have one true master because if he claims to have two, there will be a point in which he'll have to choose between the masters. And you can only put one in the number one spot. There's no room in the number one spot for two masters. Thus, Jesus is saying either I'll be number one in your life or truly I'll be number two or lower. Two things cannot share the number one spot in your life. So this morning, uh, we're talking about things competing with the lordship position over us. Something's rolling over you. Something's taking the most of your time. You're obeying something. Everybody, I don't care if you're an atheist or whatever you are, you got a master. Everybody's got a master, the number one thing of their life. So we're talking about other masters besides Jesus, other lords that rule over you, things that can rule over you. It doesn't have to be a person. Uh, and then it comes to a head, and you have to make a decision. I'll either serve Jesus over all other masters and all over all other things, or I'll heed more to these other masters instead of Jesus. So you choose. You choose your master. And so Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, again, if you want a, a theme to go along with the Matthew verse, this is a, a, a theme. And it puts it well. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey... You are that one's slaves to whom you obey. To whom you obey. All right, so this uh, is the thing, if this thing comes to a head in your life and you pick between following Jesus and another direction, and if you choose the other direction as your course of life, and you take that way, Jesus says, then I don't call me your master because I'm not. Your decision has designated who your master is, truly. Whatever you choose over me, whoever you choose, whichever path you pick instead of my way, that is your master. Uh, therefore, don't call me your master. 
because you honor another more than me. So that's what Jesus is asking. It, you know, it's really a giving up of your will for his. It's a big commitment to uh, follow Jesus Christ, to make him number one. Uh, before we get into the main outline of, of this lesson, I thought it would be important to dig in a little more to define a little more specifically what designates the number one master of your life. What things, when observed in the life of an individual, designate a master? How can you tell? Well, what's my master? Well, number one, a master is that calling or call which you answer the most. Think about that. Yes, maybe for illustrative, illustrative purposes, you can picture two or three telephones ringing in your life. And all three of them are ringing, but you can only grab one of them first. What's that for you? That's the idea of the master of your life. Uh, which one do you answer first? Number two, you could also put it this way, they call your master your top priority in life. What's your top priority in life? If it's, if it's Jesus, then great. That's why we're here. That's what we're doing. Um, if it's a choice between making your boss at work upset or making Jesus upset, sometimes we're kind of put in that position. Which master are you most concerned about disappointing between the two? Jesus sitting up in heaven who won't respond and get angry about this right away. You won't get the consequences right away. Or are you worried about your physical boss who will? You'll get a, a punishment. And number three, uh, you could call it the thing which takes up the most real estate in your mind. The thing you're thinking about the most. The thing that consumes the most of your thoughts could be called your master. Or number four, another way of putting it, is the thing that is your primary focus in life. So your main focus. What, did, what dominates your thoughts most as you walk through everyday life, day in and day out? What, what things get your attention and your time the most? Odds are that designates who your true master is. And no, just because someone does work a 40-hour-a-week job and they only come to church four hours a week or whatever it is, it doesn't mean secular work is your master. Right? You can go to work without work being your master. And some people worry about that. You could have, you could have someone working 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week, and they're, they're living and, and thinking about their Christian walk the whole time, right? as they work and while they work. And they can actually accomplish the Lord's work while they're at their job. You know, perhaps they're sacrificing sleep to make sure that they're uh, getting their Bible reading in every day. Maybe they also read on their lunch break. They're at work, but they prioritize it. Maybe as they work, they have earbuds in and they're listening to a sermon or they're listening to the Bible or they're listening to, to church songs, whatever it is. Maybe as they work all day, they're thinking, they're always thinking about serving Jesus and setting up Bible studies with the people at their work and how they can be a good example to them and how they can invite them to church, opportunities that might arise. Maybe prayer is often on their lips as they work. They'll be working and they'll say a prayer to thank God for the day. Thanking Him for an opportunity to make money to support family. Thanking Him for the blessings of life. You also have this connection that you can reach the world. A lot of times we you know, don't feel like we have connections to be able to reach people. Well, thank God that I, I have a connection that I can go to work and I can see people of the world that I can help lead them to Christ. So yes, a lot of the master discussion has to do with what's your focus? What, you, what are you thinking about all the time? What are you thinking of most of all? What takes precedent in your thoughts, taking up the most real estate, ruling your mind, reigning in your mind? So yeah, you, can, you can do other things, you can, and still have Jesus as your master. You can think about other things sometimes, have a different focus once in a while, but if it's not your main focus, Jesus can still be your master. But do you prioritize and think about the kingdom above everything else? That's all he's asking us to do. <clears throat> I don't say that lightly, as if that's all he's asking us to do. It's a lot. Put him number one. And the Lord's Supper always gets caught in my throat. <clears> throat> so, yes, a lot of this discussion is uh, what we're talking about. So in 
he's talking about our connection with the world. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the original text held a meaning which said, as you go about all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That is, as you go, with, with the knowledge that you're already going to be going about your daily life, going to work, going to school, going to these places, right? Jesus didn't want us to come out of the world, to, to seclude ourselves. Oh, I just got to dedicate my life to Jesus. I can't go to work. I can't. No, go to work. Right? He didn't want us to quit our jobs or start a secluded monastery effort to isolate ourselves because people are sinful and never interact with the world. No, not at all. He wanted us in the workforces. Think he wants Christians in the workforce? Yes. That is the light of the world. Do you think he wants Christians in the schools? Yes. He wanted us to live life in the world, but have the kingdom of God reigning in our hearts while we live in the world and walk about the world. So ask yourself questions like this. What dominates my thoughts more than anything else? Because something does. You're probably thinking of something more than anything else. Uh, what work am I most focused on? And what do I think about the most? What is my number one priority in life? Uh, if spirituality and building up the Lord's kingdom is not the thing that dominates your mind the most, then it is certain something else holds the number one spot. Something else is your master and taking up more mental real estate than the Lord. And you're probably uh, having trouble with your Christianity because you're trying to balance serving two masters at the same time. So what we're going to do for the rest of this lesson is we're going to go over an outline to talk about seven different masters in your life that often, this is across the board, try to compete with the Lord for the number one spot in people's lives. So what things are taking up the most real estate in your minds and hearts competing against Jesus' lordship over you to make a second master? Are there things that can often rule over us more so than Jesus rules over us? We know that there are things that compete. Uh, so here are seven things we'll study that compete for the number one spot in many human beings' lives, often bumping Jesus Christ and our service to him to the number two spot or lower. So seven masters. Master number one. We'll start with a specific master now that Jesus gave as an example in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 24. Okay, I, I've titled this one, Money, Wealth, Success, and Status. And I, I'm preaching this to America, right? This is, uh, um, I would say, a master that is more of a master to most than Jesus Christ is. Uh, so Jesus used the word mammon to re reference this stuff. Uh, that's the Bible word, which means money, wealth, success, and status. So we can all admit that there is a natural drive within us, at least at some point in our life, for this category of thinking. Uh, the Bible would call much of the negatives of this category materialism, covetousness, greed, a love for money, uh, certainly even linked with pride and arrogance. And yes, you, we know that necessities exist in life. Food, water, clothing, shelter. We have to have those things. God provides those things. But when, when those needs get met, it often becomes our desire to make those things more easy to come by and in abundance. Uh, so instead of just having a decent shelter over our heads, we naturally start wanting a bigger shelter, a more fancy and more elegant house. Or like the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, he tore down his barns just so that he could build bigger ones, because he could. Instead of being content to be clothed with any old clothing, we have great desire sometimes to be clothed with impressive clothing, that which tells of our financial status and success. And pride comes into this picture. Then on the other hand, we might also have a legitimate level of godly prudence in the area of money and in, in this area of life instead with godly desire. And how the Bible talks about preparing for the future, being prudent, being able to support your family, uh, not mooching off of everybody else, but working. And having something, because you've worked hard, you, you have something to give. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 29, says, When you become a Christian, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather, that's, that's the old lifestyle, now that you're a Christian, let him work. Let him labor. Working with his hands what is good. 
That's talking physical work too. Why? How? That he may have something to give him who has need. Interestingly enough, the Bible mentions the idea of working hard to reach some level of financial independence so that we can be in a position to help other people so that when opportunities arise, you'll have the resources to use and give away. So imagine someone coming up to you asking for help and you have to say, I don't have anything that I can give you. Sorry, I'm broke too. Good luck. No, God says... Work hard at this so that you have stability, that you can give to others and benefit the kingdom and be a giving group of people. Not love for money, but love for giving. And so we, see, we do as Christians. We save up money. Right? We manage our money. Staying content with the things that we have, that's an important principle. Living below our means. And then we're in a position to better help the kingdom through means of our money. We can use that money to send preachers and, and, and print off Bibles and send off material uh, for the Lord's kingdom and help the poor and, and things of that nature. So the Bible says that with that mindset, Jesus can still be your master and is your master even when you gain riches and, and wealth. But riches and wealth can be a great stumbling block, can it not? The Bible says that. Uh, it says it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not that it's impossible, but we've got to be on our toes. And seeing as that we are a rich nation, that I think we're just preaching to the whole group here. It's hard for Americans to enter into heaven because we're so rich that we lose our focus. So you see, everything on this list is not inherently sinful in and of itself. Even, even planning financially for a house with more space. Say, oh, that person's just not content with where they're at. Well, not necessarily. Right? Or saving more money to buy better clothing or whatever it might be that you're saving for is not inherently sinful in and of itself with the right heart. But uh, sometimes we just need to ask ourselves, well, what is the driving purpose behind my desire for these things? Uh, and how then when I get them, do I intend to use them? Is it my goal to gain more wealth so that I can then be lazy and kick up my feet in the Lord's kingdom and stop working? Or do I long to be in a position to where I can give more and that I can be even more useful for the Lord's kingdom and that I can free up my resources so that I can uh, use them for the Lord's work? Am I saving up money for a car so that I can be riding in eloquence that people might look at me and see what I'm driving and be impressed? Or am I saving up so that I, am I planning to increase the size of my family? need more space for more people and it's a legitimate need am i planning then to use that car to drive to bible studies shut-ins and visit the sick and do the lord's work driving my family to church and to gospel meetings there's two different ways you can look at these things that you want this or you want that you can use it for the lord or you can use it for yourself but we need to make jesus our master still our focus so you see, a follower of God can either have a godly mindset with his money and with his material things, with Jesus still as the Lord of his life, or he can acquire an ungodly mindset. Uh, so it is the ungodly mindset that Jesus was warning of us about this morning. So yes, yeah, sometimes instead of working hard for Jesus, the master, some make money their master. And Jesus actually moves them to the second spot. Sacrifices start being made more for money itself and less sacrifices being made for Jesus Christ. And we see it a lot in this country. When we start chasing mammon, as Jesus would call it, and the Lord's kingdom comes nowhere into the picture because we're chasing so much this prestige and wealth, then this is where you get into the danger of designating mammon as your master over Jesus. Wealth, prestige, status, and honor. So some people do forfeit a right relationship with God so that they can attain to more riches. Uh, it comes to a head where they need to choose between making money their primary master or Jesus. And many people <laughs> choose money in this world. Individuals who continually miss church to go to work without putting so much as a little bit of a fight up with their earthly boss. They miss out on spiritual things because, well, oh, i got to make money. Or people who think about money so much 
that when they come home, when you really should have your time freed up for Bible study, family time, and reaching lost souls, instead, their thoughts are still on money. They come home from their job, but they're actually still at their job. Right? So they think about their physical job in the workforce more than they think about their spiritual job in the kingdom of God. And that's the problem. That's when Jesus Christ has forfeited the lordship of your life when he's no longer your focus in life. And so, he, and here's a good thought, and we mentioned it before. For a faithful Christian making money, we ought to be thinking about our spiritual job even when our physical job is going on, right? We need to be thinking about the spiritual work and taking part in spiritual work even though physically we might be at the physical workplace. You don't got to punch out of your job for Jesus Christ. I don't care where you are. But sadly, many people go day in and day out being consumed with their physical work, saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, give, my, I'll give the Lord my thoughts when I have time. But i got to work right now. And then they finally do free up a second of their time, and then they give it away to more physical work and more physical money. But the Lord never ends up getting that time that he deserves and that he needs to have. Uh, so he's, he's not on your mind very much. Perhaps he's only on your mind on Sunday when we come to church. And then the rest of the, the other six days of the week, you're thinking about making money. So ask yourself uh, in this area, is money my master or is Jesus my master? Because the longer you live in this kingdom, you'll notice that many circumstances arise when you have to choose one direction or the other. Sometimes it might be you could make more money if you weren't a Christian. And oftentimes, making the most money possible causes a strain on your work for the Lord. Uh, yes, uh, sometimes the greatest soldiers of the cross, in being content with their own money right where they're at, end up sacrificing money that could be made in order to give more service and more time to Jesus Christ rather than money. So, as we conclude point number one and move on to the rest, just know when Jesus was talking about mammon can't be your master, if wealth alone is your primary goal, like so many in America, then Jesus tells it to us plain. Right? When you serve money alone, very quickly, Jesus Christ is bumped to the number two spot, which is what we got to be careful of. So before you know it, uh, someone bends over backwards for all things revolving around their physical job and making money, and Jesus Christ quickly takes a back, back seat in this country. So master number one is the master that Jesus warned us about specifically. No man can serve two masters. He can't serve God and wealth at the same time. Oh, and by the way, Jesus said specifically, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23. It makes many individuals fall from the faith. So don't ever let it happen to you. We have to choose to have the right mindset about our money and not make it our master. All right, number two. Uh, master number two is a big one on this list and and one master you might not have thought would have been up here but you might listen to this more than you listen to jesus christ and that is fear master number two is fear uh, sometimes when taking orders from jesus christ and his new covenant we are tempted to take more orders and obey our fearful thoughts rather than obeying god go and preach the gospel to every creature god says but fear says, no, evangelism is an outrageous request. I can't talk about spiritual things at work or with my lost family members or my friends. It might make things awkward or make them ups upset. I mean, you're not supposed to talk about politics or religion, right? we got to talk about religion. We have to, even though it's kind of a scary thing. It's a scary conversation to have with people. we would got to make sure people hear it and get saved by the truth. God says, you need to take a stand for what's right in this world and speak up on moral issues. Fear says, nah, keep your mouth shut, Christian. No one wants to hear what you've got to say. God says, gather with the saints and put the best effort in, of your life into pleasing the Lord and coming together to serve his people. Fear says, I'm scared to make that 100% commitment to the Lord and his church. So I have excuses on the back burner for why I don't come sometime. Um, sometimes in the Lord's body, here, here's a, a sensitive topic. Anxiety and depression can overcome individuals, truly. 
leading them to give an excuse for not honoring this great commitment to Jesus Christ uh, because they become anxious. You know, was, was Jesus pretty anxious before he went to the cross? The Bible says that he sweat drops of blood. And as he was thinking about what this was, he, he wished that it could depart from him, this task. So someone with anxiety and depression says, well, I would be more attuned to be part of the church and be more involved, but you know, my anxiety gets the best of me. I, I worry about things. It's hard. I understand it's hard. But I say you better overcome that fear before the Lord comes back or you'll really have something to be scared about. Right? It is a fearful thing. When I have something to be scared about. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And the Bible says when you follow him, there, there's nothing to fear. And perfect love casts out fear. So some sulk into a pit of despair at times and get nothing done for the Lord because they're scared to deal with people. And this is a people religion, right? We're meant to be fishers of men. And people are scared to exit their comfort zones and, and to perform the expectations of Christ and his church because we have anxiety. The Bible says fear is a master that will lead many people to hell. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. The fearful, the cowardly, will have their part in that dreaded lake of fire. No, don't let fear rule in your life or guide your decisions. Fear cannot be the master over you. And I don't want any of the ones I love in, in Christ's kingdom to fall short, including myself, because we're scared to follow the commands. And there are many commands that we sometimes don't follow because it's a scary thing to do. So master number two that can be served more than Christ is fear. Uh, next, num master number three. Uh, pick whichever of these three titles you want for this one because they're all the same category. Sin, the flesh, or Satan. Satan tempts man to sin by the desires of your flesh. You know, James chapter 1, verse 14. It says... Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, his own flesh, and enticed. So it can be said that sin is your master. It could be said that when this happens, your flesh, your own flesh is your master. It tells you what to do and you do it. Or it can be said that Satan is your master because he's tempting you with your own flesh. And if you give in to these things. So when you take this route, which we all have, uh, then all three can be said to be your master if you have not sought justification through the gospel system. So with reference to Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, again, one of our theme verses, Paul said, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves to whom you obey? Whether of sin, sin is your, is your master leading to death, or of obedience is your master leading to righteousness. Whoever you obey. Uh, as John chapter 12 and verse 31 calls Satan the ruler of this world. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 calls him the prince of the power of the air. There's a sense in which he's, he's, a, he's a major master. Satan is a master over people of this world. The Bible says Satan is the master behind all those who fall short of following the Lord, pushing them to sin because of their fleshly desires. It comes to a head all the time, and you have to make a decision about who you're going to listen to. All right? Number one, either you're going to listen to your flesh when it's telling you what it wants to do, being tempted by the devil, and you're going to listen to your flesh. Or number two, you're not going to listen to your flesh. You're going to listen to God. The works of the flesh are heaven. And that's, that's the way it works throughout the years. You know, Adam and Eve, for example, the first example of this, were the first ones faced with the decision of which master they would choose. God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was his law for them. Uh, but their flesh, tem tempted by Satan, wanted to eat. Two opposing masters, two opposing requests came to a head because of their desires, and they had to make a decision. To whom shall I serve? And which one becomes a true master over a person to whom you yield yourself slaves to obey? You are that one slaves to whom. So who did Adam and Eve listen to? They did not listen to God. They started listening to Satan, and sin was brought into the world. So that day, Adam and Eve both chose to follow sin instead of following God. 
and that's when it happened. Uh, and it was the first time in human history that another master finally took God's place. Uh, and sin began to reign in man's heart, and, but not God. And so uh, each and every day, we have choices to make regarding the one we wish to make our master. Uh, Jesus Christ, yet there's another voice calling us always in the other direction, and the one behind that is Satan. Uh, Jesus tells us to remain pure, but the flesh desires lust. Jesus tells us to love, but the flesh desires hate, to fornicate, to partake in drunkenness, and so on and so forth with the laws of God. And so we have a lifestyle choice to make under the gospel system. God says under the gospel system, 1 John 1, 7, the Christians will walk in the light, their course of life, choosing me as their course of life, then I'll count you as faithful if that's your direction in life and your theme. But if you choose a lifestyle of darkness, 1 John 1, 6, to walk in darkness, then you'll designate your master as one besides Jesus Christ. So man, there, there are some pretty plain things Scripture says about putting something else as the master of your life. To whom do you yield the most, God or Satan? God's going to be looking at who you yield to more. God's call or Satan's call, good or evil, and which master do you serve? So master number one, we talked about the call toward money and riches. Number two, the master of fear. Number three, sin, the flesh, and Satan. And now uh, let me give you the remaining four a little bit more quickly because I think you're getting the point. Anything could put be put in that number one spot in your life above Jesus. So let's keep going. Point number four, even relationships to other people can take precedent over Jesus Christ and become higher of a master than him. You know, it could be a romantic relationship, a, a parent-child relationship, any family relationship or a best friend, whatever relationship it might be. Again, relationships are good to have in this world, are they not? God wants us to have relationships, so long as there's nothing sinful about the relationship, of course. But if, if that relationship takes priority over serving God, then even this can become your master over Christ. So, for example, I've heard people say on Sundays, the, the Lord's Day, the, the, the day we're supposed to come together to worship, yeah, I, I missed out on church this morning uh, so that I could spend time with my family. And we went out to breakfast instead of coming to church. And I suppose that God would probably respond in a similar fashion to how he scolded Israel in the Old Testament uh, when they used to work on the Sabbath day and they wanted to get more work done. He said, six days you have to get your work done. But the Sabbath is a day dedicated to the Lord. So God would surely say about the same thing with your family commitments. My right, family is important. Yes, yeah, don't get me wrong. That's not what the Bible's saying. But he might say, listen, you have six days to spend time with Grandpa. You have six days that you can prioritize and, and have, make special time for your kids. Do that. That's important. And your spouse, of course. Hey, you, you can even spend time with them before or after services. Better yet, bring them to services. That'll be family time. You come together with your family. But the first day of the week under the new covenant, that's the Lord's day when the disciples came together to honor the Lord. So yes, family is important, but not more important than your commitment to the Lord. And remember, it was Jesus himself who said, and people think family is the most important thing in the world, not more important than following Jesus. And he said, Matthew 10, 37 through 39, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He's asking a lot. He is. And he who takes, does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And then he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So grandpa, mom, dad, spouse, sibling, they take a second seat. Though they're high up on your priority list, they've got to take a second seat to God in his kingdom. Bring them with you, though, and you prioritize them at the same time. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you, right? Okay, master number five is amusement. There's travel, fun, entertainment, fun events, right? Sometimes, if you want to put it this way, we prioritize fun stuff more than serving the Lord. 
We like to have fun. That's not to say that serving the Lord is not fun. I think it's fun. Um, but you know what I mean. People of the world often prioritize getting the maximum enjoyment out of life as much as humanly possible. Planning trips. Nothing inherently sinful about that, but planning trips, always thinking about vacations and, and entertainment, yet some don't think about God's spiritual work at all. They give all their time to amusement. Some will willfully sit through a four-hour football game in the freezing cold at the end of November, but they can't get out of bed on a Sunday morning to come be here for two hours with God's people in a warm building. Right, where are our priorities? What master are we serving? Sometimes we'll sit down at night and we'll scroll through our phones on Facebook and YouTube because it's amusing. It entertains us. I like to do that sometimes. But when we ought to be spending more time scrolling through our Bibles or turning the pages of, of God's good book and studying the Word. All right, so we, we are distracted people. Satan tries to distract us and make that our master. Movies, social media, and other forms of amusement. And we have become an undisciplined society that grows increasingly bored with the service of the Lord. Right? We would rather be entertained. And that's why so much entertainment seems to have come into American churches. And it's, they think they can combine the two. Oh, let's make this a party when we come together. All right, but I'll tell you what, uh, this world, this whole the reason we're here on the earth is not for the purpose of being amused. God's not trying to entertain us. We're actually being tested by the Lord. We're being, our purpose is to serve the Lord. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every evil thing, whether good or bad. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Uh, so he's, he's supposed to be our master, not fun, right? Uh, point number six, some put as their master their own physical health, becoming obsessed with it. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Paul said bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, the most profitable. All right, fitness, again, none of these inherently sinful, but fitness, dieting, looking good, anti-aging, sometimes that becomes the master and might I say the idol of some people's lives. And really, that's a word we haven't used much this morning, but that's really what this discussion is all about, is idolatry. New Testament idolatry. Idolatry in its simplest form is anything that you put before God in the number one spot in order to worship it and serve it. You shall have no other gods before me. That means anything. Right, so you're getting the idea. Nothing can sit in that number one spot besides God. And if it does, it has become your idol. And idolatry is sinful. It's become your master. Lastly, number seven, we'll wrap up with this. Good way, I think, to wrap up all seven of these. Many, instead of, instead of having Jesus as their ultimate master, serve the master of self. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. Right, but with that mindset, we're not at all following the Lord Jesus when we think that way. Because Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, deny self, and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, Paul says, you're, you're a slave. So I'm talking in physical terms, but I have to use this language. You're a slave to Christ or you're a slave to Satan. Which one are you going to be a slave to? He who finds his life shall lose it. He who loses his life for my sake and the gospels shall save it. And seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So just put them first. Put them in the number one spot of your life. That's what it means to be the master. So these seven things we need to be aware of, uh, not to let Jesus Christ be bumped to number two. Uh, so if you're not a Christian today, if you've not entered into the spiritual fold of safety, the Bible says you got to do this and then make him your, the master of your life. Submit to the gospel. So it's preached into all the world that salvation's available and remission of sins. You can have sin washed from your record. Here's what you got to do. The Bible says you got to hear that word, the gospel. You got to believe every word of it about who Jesus is, what he came down to do. Believe every word. Repent it means once you get it, you have to have a change of mind about the course of life you're living, putting sin away, putting that lifestyle away. You have to confess Christ before men. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
And then you have to, upon that confession and repentance and belief, go down into the waters of baptism. Acts 2.38 says, For the remission of your sins. You come up out of the water having been baptized into his death. You rise up having been united in the likeness of his death. You'll also be in the likeness of his resurrection. You rise up out of that water and you live to walk in newness of life, to be faithful to the covenant. And when you slip up, the Bible says you just need to pray to God. You don't got to go get baptized again. You've already done that. You've already signed the contract. You got to pray to God when you slip up, confess that fault, and repent again. Repent, confess, and pray. And that's like a windshield wiper that's continually wiping you clean your whole life as long as you keep faithful to this covenant. So if anybody has not done that today, if you have any questions about your salvation, the water is ready today. Don't leave here today without doing it. Um, and if any Christians feel that they've fallen short and need prayers or repentance from the church, um, need to confess anything, uh, have a seat on the front row while we stand and while we sing.